AI offers us new opportunities to expand what we can do as a ufology researcher. Understanding these technologies and rather than being fearful of them can put us in a new place of being able to detect and discover and expand the field of research. Even today, there are techniques that have been used to crowdsource or tap into a quicker way to identify objects. Even SETI used their program in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence where they distributed an application called SETI at Home. There's probably a few people that are still members of this application today. It allows people to crunch parts of the signals being detected on their home computer and then send that analysis back up to SETI. In a sense, using all the systems in the world to compute data rather than just the ones that they would have access to. So AI is a way of using computer assistance to speed up the activities that you want. Now, Hollywood has done a really good job of kind of showcasing how AI can be used good and bad. Now in 2001, we have a great example of the computer HAL who makes decisions autonomously and has a personality and even goes beyond human thinking in making decisions, which in some cases isn't good. In other cases, like in the movie Interstellar, we see that the robot that they used there was one that was very sophisticated in intelligence and being able to do things. And actually, in part of the movie, it actually crossed over into the fifth dimension, communicating with non-human intelligence as a way to explain the bridge of communication that they had developed as this 3D space uh, you know, that allowed the, uh, the actor Matthew McConaughey to kind of navigate so just through one piece of time. Now, Close Encounters does a really good example, again, of showing how technology can assist us in a communication uh, with some other non-human intelligence. If you remember that the critical scene before the aliens actually come out was that they have an exchange, an exchange in sound. Without this tonal frequency as a standard for communication, they had no way to begin an open line of feeling comfortable to have further interactions. So to have this baseline of communication, you can see that right now it's a human interacting with the mothership. It's not fast enough. Eventually you'll see that for them to have proper communication, what needs to take place is the computer takes over the conversation and then a meaningful dialogue takes place. Point I want to stress here is that technology, artificial intelligence, can allow us a deeper bridge in communicating with a non-human intelligence. Here comes the AI. First day of school, fella. Starts to speed up. Very difficult for the humans to start being able to keep up playing manually. And so after learning the patterns and knowing what it wants to communicate, we can turn it over to the computer to speak much more efficiently and faster in responses. Here it comes. We have a translation airlock on their audio signal. We're taking over this conversation now. There goes the app. Happiness and caution, all frequencies covered just through sound and light. Again, using a baseline for tonal vibration and sound. But they needed that computer assistance to help them. Now, if you remember this key scene where the first being that comes out is this kind of android looking creature uh, before they interact with all the, the smaller creatures. Um, but this is a key scene in understanding that this interaction wouldn't have taken place unless, unless they could establish a baseline of communication, which they also did through hand signals. Now, in other movies more recently, again, we can see that AI can assist in how we can form this baseline of communication. In the movie Arrival, these 
beings, the heptapods, were able to use a nonlinear version of communication that extended beyond time. Of course, we couldn't understand this, but eventually we were able to discern certain words that mean certain symbols, hypothetically. And so with that knowledge, being able to construct a database that we can easily tap into for hundreds of thousands of symbol recognition, this allows us for an instant real-time way to, to identify what perhaps the beings are saying to the, human, to the humans. So you can see in this scene that she's actually using a laptop to discern in real time what the heptopods are probably saying by using an AI-assisted database of information. So if you think about that, this, this, offers, this offers a lot of opportunities in understanding that the way we can form future baseline communications with non-human intelligence is with AI assistance. Um, if you remember the work of Clifford Stone, who said he was going on site to crash recovery locations, and we, again, have to form some type of baseline communication if there was a non-human intelligence present. And several times there were ETs that are in these craft that had been either shot down or wrecked for whatever reason. And I guarantee you they were using some type of classified technology, perhaps like what you saw in Close Encounters, that would allow them to form some type of baseline like, we're here, we're not going to hurt you, we're here to help you, we're here to help you, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. So uh, it's very interesting if you follow the line of evidence of how AI has been used and how Hollywood likes to hype it. Um, you know, if we do ever, you know, discover ETs, uh, for instance, on other planets as we go to Mars and such, we're going to need to have uh, this type of technology. And you can see that it's been prevalent for thousands of years. You know, if we look at the wall drawings and evidence that's left to us, in many cases, you see them using some type of assisted technology. Um, even in this classic scene where the man is looking up over his uh, shoulder, guy, you know, guiding his eye, guarding his eye, because there's clearly something visible in the sky there. Again, some type of technology. Um, so you have to understand that, you know, even in these representations in ancient times, the ability for these craft to fly in our atmosphere or make decisions autonomously, all of this has to be involving some type of um, self-aware programming. Let's just call it artificial intelligence. Uh, so again, going back into the Renaissance, seeing shields and flying disks uh, of this nature, all the evidence points to these craft uh, being around for thousands of years. And most likely, even in going back into the most ancient records that we have, the Sumerian culture, in talking about their interactions with their gods, the Anunnaki, also described these ijiji. There were certain lines of communication that you would speak to them to understand whether it was human or acting as if. To me, that sounds like an android. Again, a lot of the depictions that they've left us look like modern day, probably hybridization projects of what we call the gray alien. Most likely, these aliens are not breeding like us. They're genetically brought to life in some type of cloning mechanism. So, you know, the future is very interesting, again, when we look at assisted technology to be able to communicate with non-human intelligence, especially as we start to approach Mars in the next couple of years. Um, who knows? Looking into the past and how ancient civilizations were encountering this form of artificial intelligence might also start to help us form our understandings of the way it's shaping today. Stay tuned.